Welcome back to Friend DA. Let's jump back uh, right where we just left off. I'm going to tell the story a little bit also. Uh, what were you just eating? People are going to ask, right? It was kind of... It was kind of oh, there's there just some... Red, there is these red spaghettis. They're strawberry. They're very good. Okay. All right. I just... I wasn't done. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Let's, let's go. I gave you a count in, Rami. All right. You got it. The I, production moves forward no matter what. All right. That's just exactly. Uh so while you were at university, I, I feel like you got a little bit of a uh early glimpse into the business world. Uh when the school demanded the rights to the game that you were creating uh with your soon to be business partner. How much did this shape what you would become uh, in the the following years. Is there a version of Rami where you were, you know, at a triple A studio working on the next Horizon Zero Dawn or something like that? Like, how, how much of that changed your path? I mean, obviously, it changed a lot. So, so the the one missing part of the of the puzzle is when I tried to go when I tried to go to university. Um, there were two Dutch schools that gave game design. Uh, there was one of them in Utrecht and one of them south in Breda. And the Breda one was very much a AAA focus. It was, uh, you could choose between art or programming. And then the one in Utrecht was design. Um, and I applied for both of them because I didn't know what I wanted to do in the industry per se, but I, I knew I wanted to be probably a programmer. So the one in Breda actually made a lot of sense. I applied for both of them got accepted into both of them, and then just messed up a piece of paperwork, which disallowed me from studying for a year. Um, so instead of going to university, I ended up um, getting a job. And I worked at Media Markt, which is uh, Best Buy, but like West European, I guess. Hey, they have PS4s um, or PS5s available as of yesterday, by the way. Uh, uh, they're sold out. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah. I know Media Mart yeah. because of yesterday. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so I worked there for a year selling computers and doing computer service and, uh, you know, fixing people's broken computers. I'd done that as sort of like an entrepreneur thing a few years earlier, just started fixing people's computers for money. Um, so I sold computers for uh, for a year actually kept that job throughout uh, university. Um, it taught me a lot about like, you know, talking to people, negotiating, like figuring out like how to make things a win-win as much as possible, but, you know, mostly for my boss. Um, and then the second, uh, the, the second time when I applied to, to these schools, I had kind of shifted in my thinking, thinking I was already a capable programmer and I had taught myself all of that. So if I wanted to be a better programmer, I could probably just be practicing, right? Like buy the books and do it myself. So I decided that I was going to go either for art, which I was terrible at, or design, which I, I just it sounded pretty vague, but whatever, I'll try. Um, and I ended up being convinced that um, design was the best option for me. So I ended up at the Utrecht School of Art and Technology, started there, and the first year was awesome. First year was genuinely great. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I practiced to be a programmer. I was not good at anything else. I was not a good designer. I was not a good uh, artist. I had never worked in teams, like proper teams before. Um, so I went to school and just, they taught me all of this stuff. Like I learned to draw better. I learned to like work in teams, work, learn to deal with like, saving like things with backups and um met all these other game developers that talked about the same things and had stories similar to mine and for the first time in my life i felt at home at a place and then came the second year and the second year was awful because um the school was switching between two curriculums this was relatively young-ish program and um, it basically meant that the second year was the same as the first. And, you know, where the first year was curiosity and just awesomeness, and the second year was just complete boredom. And I think as we established earlier, I don't deal well with boredom. So I decided to set up a project. Uh, it was called a lens flare, and it was based on... Um, 
the fact that before all of this happened, I worked on this, and I say worked on as a very generous description. I did a little bit of help on the series called the Star Wraith games, which are these um, combat space simulations made by um, Sean Bauer, who lives in uh, Boise, Idaho. <laughs> um, and this, this man is an inspiration. Like he was making independent games way before indie was a thing, and he was selling them online. Um, he did most of it himself. He did the modeling. He did the programming. He got some help with music later on. I helped a little bit with art. I was a play tester, and like if over time, I helped here and there with with different things. Um, and I just it, it was it was wild that you could do this. This man was earning money. Like making games alone, it was great. Um, so, for context, my my experience at that point at commercial games was space space sims. So, when I got bored, I said, "Well, I'll make my own." Right? Uh, there's enough students that are uh, good that are good enough to make a commercial game. So. Uh, Xbox Live Arcade was like the big thing back then. If you if you wanted to sell a game on console and you were an indie, you could choose between Xbox Live indie games, or if you were a big deal, you could do Xbox Live Arcade. So I went, here's the deal. I'm going to get a team together, going to make an Xbox Live Arcade game. We're not going to aim low, we're going to aim for the stars, and we'll just do it. Like, what's the worst that could happen? Had Braid come out yet um, when this was all happening? Did it happen? This was 2010. So I think it might have maybe it might have just come out yeah okay because it that, i mean that's what put xbox live arcade on the map essentially uh, right. in a lot of cases but so yeah. i'm guessing it must have been out like sure. that was that was the big leaks right like this yeah. was that's what... so i got together 12 12 to 14 of the best students in the school not in my year like just the entire school i got the best artist i could find i got musicians from the music department of the school um I got the best programmers that I knew. I got the best designer that I knew. And one of those designers um, was Jan Nijman, who ended up being my co-founder at Lambeard. Um, me and him didn't like each other, and I can, I can tell that story later. But uh, the short version is this team was everybody that I felt had the potential to do exceptional work in this school. Mm. And um, which immediately did two things, right? Number one was we immediately started working at an incredibly high level. Number two is it made everybody that was not involved in that team incredibly angry at me or <laughs> basically saying that I didn't think they were good enough to be on this team. So Yeah, they wanted to be in the um, cool kids club. Yeah, I immediately learned that that is a bad idea um, and to not do that again. But um, we started working on this game and it actually it went pretty well. And in hindsight, I can... I have, like, with 100% certainty, I can tell you that game would have turned into a like, trash fire. There was no <laughs> way we were going to get it done, right? Um, we were 12 to 20 people with no management experience making a commercial game with no idea about certification or the platform. Um, we didn't have enough, like, direction to really get super far, but we got it far enough that we managed to pitch it at Xbox Live Arcade and actually got pretty far into, like, getting accepted into that. Yeah. Until the point came where we had to sign a deal. And I made a really big mistake. I told school. And they immediately dropped a contract clause on me that was part of the student agreement that I was not allowed to do that because they own any work that gets made at school as long as I'm a student at school. So they killed the deal. Um, they say it was out of safety you know, like don't want students to do things that could get them into financial trouble or legal trouble. Um, I didn't care. Like then, <laughs> if I get in trouble, like I get in trouble. That's it's my choice. Um, so um, I decided to quit. Right, like that was it. Like I, I fought as much as I could. And when I realized there was no way to save this project and that I was going to have to break my promise to my team that I was going to get this game done and that we were going to get it signed with Xbox Live Arcade. Um, 
I just couldn't like there was no there was no way for me to take that school seriously anymore if they aren't teaching me and they're blocking students from learning on their own uh, accord uh, then what what am I doing there so I decided to quit uh, I told my parents who both had like a bad day that day <laughs> um, and um and that was it and then I realized that I'm very like the things I had gotten good at were thinking about games in a commercial context i was a good programmer and i was very capable of polishing a product right these these were my skills um i was not good at the business i was not good at the art i was not good at starting games like i was not the ideas guy um i was i, I could finish things and there was one guy on that team that was good at starting things and he was Jan Willem, uh, and he had gone good at that by making like 99 shitty games a year. Like he made a game like every day, he got home from school. He had this internet forum called the uh, Popocast. Uh, and the Popocast was this international community of, of kids that used Game Maker. And they would get out of school because they were all school kids. And they would just go like, make a game about a dog chasing a car. Uh, be done by 7 p.m. And they would all make a game in like three hours. And the thing is, none of them were like good, but they all got their own tricks at making the games feel like they might be good. Mm -hmm. JW got really good at screen shake, or really good at like instant feedback, like kineticism, like things like impacting each other, like bouncing off each other. Um, he was really good at that. But then all of his games were still shit because he never finished them. He just made the thing for three hours and then he was like, I guess I'm done now. And he moved on to the next one. So I sat down with JW and he had this little prototype called Craze from Hell. And he said, okay, we're going to quit. This is the game. This is what we're going to make. We're going to make this as good as possible. And then we're going to sell that on Xbox Live Arcade. And, uh, and thus we dropped out. And I genuinely don't know what would have become of me if that hadn't happened. Because I have a lot of, a lot of my personality is a high risk is is like i'm i'm a person that needs to build things right like i'm not good at maintaining things um i have a huge problem with authority like i can give people authority over me but i can't i can't accept somebody having authority over me for any reason but i gave it to them it just it just doesn't work in my head like you don't get to tell me what to do unless i think you're better at deciding what I should do that me. Sure. Um, and I don't want to tell anybody who is under me in any hierarchy to do what they do, because if I knew better, then I wouldn't have hired them. Right? Like at Vlambeer, our artists, we would just go to the artists and be like, here's the game. Go for it. Just be like, I can do whatever I want. I was like, yeah, no, if we knew how to do art, we would do it. Like we hired you because we have no fucking idea. Draw the sprite and see what happens. Um, <laughs> So for me, um, that path I was on with school, it wasn't really leading anywhere, if you think about it. Like, I wouldn't be able to work in a team well, especially not back in those days when I was that stubborn. Uh, I needed the right people around me to be able to grow my like in understanding of design and like teamwork. Um, I don't know what would have happened. Uh, I would probably have gotten a job somewhere and uh, been really miserable. Uh, and then eventually dropped out of that and started my own company with whoever would be a good idea at that time. And then probably have tried the Vlamber thing anyway. Yeah. Um, but there was something specific about the collaboration between JW and I and specific about that timing that none of the success that I've had would have been possible without him or vice versa. Like it's a remarkable meeting of people. I think yeah. a lot of times when people tell stories, they leave out the, the rough parts, right? Cause no one wants to hear about how hard the struggle was. They want to hear what happened at the end of it. Was there a struggle, you know, dropping out your parents obviously oh. were not okay with that yeah. uh, whatsoever. No. It, it wasn't, it wasn't drop out the next or day, start flam beer, right? Like there was some period in between that. It, it honestly, actually, it was pretty much that. But the the thing the thing you have to remember is deciding to drop out was a lot earlier. Um, 
We decided to drop out like a month before the school year ended. And we had to tell them that we were quitting before that. And we had no, we were terrified, like, <laughs> genuinely terrified. Like in the Netherlands, dropping out of school is, it makes no sense. Like mm. what, why? Like you're, you're learning the thing you want. At the end of it, you'll have a piece of paper that says you're good at the thing you want. Like, why would you, why not just take two more years, sit through it and just, and I just, I morally couldn't be part of that school anymore. JW just was bored. Like that was genuinely his excuse. He, he was just bored of the school. Um, the hard part, I think, was convincing myself that I was doing the right thing, mm. right? That, that this was not the worst mistake of my life. Because in hindsight, it's really easy to say like, oh, this worked out. Right, right. But at the start of it, you look at it and it's, it's not even a mountain, it's a wall. Like it's a, it's a wall that goes to space and you're running straight at it, hoping like hoping that it's the fall guy's door, you know, like that <laughs> if you jump into it, it'll open. Right. Um, it's door dash all over again. And it just, every day that it got closer, that final day of the year was scarier. And we negotiated with school. We, we tried to make a deal with them. Um, we negotiated with the, the, the Dutch Game Garden, which was this building where all these starting game studios were in, and we wanted to get uh, an office there. And we just we started pitching. We started uh, talking to companies that could buy flash games of ours. We made very sure not to do any work on the school computers. Um, but as these days kept crept closer and closer, it got scarier and scarier. And uh, honestly, for the first few months after. Um, for the first few months after we dropped out, I was still not sure I made the right choice, right? Uh, we had this little office that we got from the Dutch Game Garden for free. We got to use it for a few months. Um, but after that, we needed money. Yeah. Um, and we had, we had none. And the problem is me and JW both aren't good at anything. Like, we're good at what we do. That's the only thing we're good at in life. Like, I can't. I'm sure I could if I put my mind to it, but I can't jobs like i got lucky with the salesman job because it turned out i enjoyed selling stuff uh especially computers but if they had moved me to like the kitchen department i'm just miserable like i would have been miserable like all the time and i i would not be able to function in that right um so uh, i've gotten consistently lucky that i never had to um, I never had to reckon with that negative side of me where I've been in a position where I had to do something that I really didn't want to do. And every time I've had to make a choice based on that gut feeling that it wasn't going where I wanted, uh, it worked out. Right. Um, so yeah, it was super scary. We got our team together for super great box. And then, uh, because we needed money, we made radical fishing, which was a flash game about fishing with machine guns. Right. Uh, we sold we'll that for $10,001. <laughs> And um, that that was it. That that was it. Then we had ten thousand dollars. Like it was, there, there was an article on Kotaku. Yeah. Like, holy shit! Like clearly we made it, right? Like that. And that was that was the last time I um I ever wondered whether I made the right choice because it I wouldn't have I wouldn't have had that otherwise. Sure. And from that point on, it was it was a roller coaster. Uh. And it didn't stop until three weeks ago. <laughs> we'll get to the games. We'll get to the end of uh, Vlam Beer. Um, you stated in a recent interview with with Polygon that you and JW were never really friends, and you actually said the same thing, you know, ten or fifteen minutes ago. Uh, with him adding into it in the Polygon interview uh, that you two had a really good dynamic. Uh, so, do you feel that this like helped make? Flam beer, what it was uh, in its formative years as a business. The fact that yeah. you seemed very keen of each other and and what each other were good at, and the fact that you necessarily weren't there for a social relationship, you were there to work. Yeah, no, it it was great, and I, you know, people ask me like, how do you start a studio like Flam beer? And I'm like, find the perfect person that you dislike. Uh, like that's it. That's the whole trick. Like there's no other trick to it. Um. And it's impossible. You can't do it. JW and I had a very specific form of working together that uh, 
um, was at the right time at the right place. Um, and and what the thing is, the first time I met Flambeer, uh, met Flambeer, the first time I met JW was in a train to school in the first year, and I was talking about these space sims that I've been working on, and um, JW had been making all these crappy games like sixty to a hundred a year. Um, I thought he was the most obnoxious hipster kid art asshole that I had ever met. Like nothing, nothing was good for him. Like as soon as money was involved, he hated it. Um, his idea of design was like stubborn and just annoying. Like just annoying, just an annoying kid. And he genuinely thought I was just a suit. He was like, "You're not here for the art. You're not here for the craft. You're not here for the creativity. You're just here for the for the money. Like you don't care." Um, and it was eight a.m. in the train to school. I was talking about the space sim, and the first thing JW ever said to me was, it's 8 a.m., can you please shut the fuck up? <laughs> um, and that was it. And I think it perfectly summarizes the 10 years that followed. Uh, we don't agree about anything. We never agreed about anything. We don't. We In our office, JW chose the music. We ran a six meter, like 18 foot cable around the office to my desk where I controlled the volume because we couldn't agree about the music and we had to figure out a compromise to make that work. Uh, he would play like the music I hated most uh, every time just because he could. And then, you, you know, the, the worst thing is like that music would be popular a year and a half later. Um, and then I would like it and he would play different music. Um, JW always had a really good sense of design. He had a very specific sense of what he wanted to create. He just never knew how to polish it into something good. And um, we don't we don't like talking about anything. There were three things we agreed on. We agreed that um, we agreed about the big decisions of Vlambeer every time. We agreed about um, we agreed that uh, games should be games again, which was kind of a weird thing but back then there was a lot of narrative games coming up and we just wanted to make mechanical games and the third one was like bad sci-fi is really good uh that was the only things we agreed about and that that was it there was nothing else i I don't like his sense of music i don't like his sense of movies we went to we went on a double date to watch um arrival once because our girlfriends at the time agreed to go on a double date and it was the worst they made us sit next to each other i hated it um i love the movie and jw just came out and said like so it's basically which movie did he compare it to like event horizon or something it's basically event horizon but shit i was like you know what we will never agree about any um it was just the, the worst it, like I just I would never go to his birthday. Oh yeah, contact. It was contact, but worse. <laughs> um, but he just we just had nothing in common. Like we agree about nothing. Uh, we don't care about the same things. But the um, the thing that worked is that we left each other space to do the work that we were good at. Um, JW uh, was is remains to this day and will probably forever be a really good designer of um, of interaction between objects, right? Like that's just what he's good at. Ninety five percent of games is that, so he will always be an exceptional game designer. Um, and um, and he has this specific sense of the world and media that is very different than mine. And I'm somebody, I like to finish things. I like to make them good. I like to make them accessible. I like to make sure that people can play it and enjoy it and have like sort of a a journey from start to finish where they learn a game, get better at a game, like eventually like move away from the game. Um, And we just instantly recognized that these were complementary skills, uh, but also that we would have to work together. So we just said, JW, you have veto power over everything in design. I will have veto power over everything else. I'm going to do the business because if you do it, we're going to be out of business in three weeks. Um, and that was it. And that's literally what we did. At the start, we didn't trust each other. Um, like speaking of like the rough times, uh, JW, would like, we would program a thing, right? 
And he would go like, oh, this needs to be uh, like this bullet needs to move 3.5 pixels a frame, which immediately pissed me off <laughs> because you can't do 0.5 pixels. 0.5 pixels doesn't exist. It's either the left pixel or it's the right pixel. It can't be the middle because there's no middle pixel. Like that's not how pixels work. But the programming language that he used allowed for 0.5s and it would just it would just do it. So if you did, uh, you drew something at one, and then at 1.5 extra, it would be at two and a half, and it would just draw it at either two or three. And then you would add another 1.5, and it would just be at five. Mm. Like the programming language he used allowed that, even though it's just fucking infuriating. <laughs> like, just whoever made it, like, I just, I still want to punch that person. Um, so he would go, like, okay, 1.5. And, um, and I would, I'm a programmer. So he would say, let's say he would say 15 and a half. I would program a slider. He would just say like, it's 15 and a half. And I'm like, bullshit. Um, so I would program a slider and I'd go, okay, 10. Try it too slow. Okay, 20, too fast. Okay, like 11, too slow. Okay, like 19, too fast. And eventually I would be like 15.4, too slow. 15.6, too fast. He was always right. It was a fury. He was always right. I always tried to find something he got wrong. It was just never there. Um, but then he wouldn't know how to program the stuff he wanted to do, and I would program that. And then he wouldn't know how to sell the games, and I would do that. I would do the business. I would make the marketing. I would make sure that the like I would create the tutorial and like you know figure out how to make things work, how to create that user journey. And eventually, we created good games because we just gave each other no space to make bad decisions. Mm. Like if he ever got a number wrong, you betcha I would be right there and be like, "I got you." This is bad. Fix it. Um, and if he ever got something, if he ever saw me do something wrong, he would he would call me up because we didn't like we didn't have to be nice. I don't care about like it's not that I don't care about his feeling. I just don't care about hurting his feelings over a bad decision. Like if he made a bad decision, he deserves to be told that he made a bad decision. Sure. Um, and it just like we grew super fast. That was one. Like we got better at our jobs so fast because we had somebody there that felt very capable that you respected that just gave you shit all the time, right? Um, and number two is we made good games because if me and JW agreed about something, it had to be good because we don't like the same stuff. If both of us liked it, the audience that we were speaking to were people like me and people like him. And that was huge. Hmm. So uh, that's that's kind of what happened, I guess. Um, but I still, I would still never invite him to my birthday. I, I got you harping on that. I got, you said it multiple times in the interview. You're saying it multiple times here. You just don't want to go to his birthday, best, man. It's the best way to explain it. Like I sure. no social interest. Like um, I was convinced to invite him to my wedding back in the day by by my ex wife. Like that. Yeah. It wasn't me. Like I didn't. I didn't go. Like, oh, we should really invite. You gotta you invite out. your business partner. I, I, no, I that. like absolutely not. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. But um, it was really nice having him here. But um, uh, having him there. But also, like, shit. Sure. Like, sure. It's not my choice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Flambear is quite the storied history when it comes to being only a ten-year-old company. Uh, when you guys closed up shop earlier this month. Uh, I don't plan on touching on the entire list of products because you guys definitely have a, a pretty storied history with, you know, games for Devolver with the Serious Sam and all of that. But I do want to touch on a few. Uh, you mentioned Super Crate Box. Uh, it was the first to come out of the studio in, in 2010 and it earned a uh, finalist position in the excellent in, Excellence in Design category at the Independent Games Festival. Um, how did success so early on affect you and the company? Like, did it set expectations? I uh, I don't want to call it, <laughs> I guess I will call it an ego, but I'll call it a healthy one for, for qualification. Uh, did it set that healthy ego for Blambear early on? No, it made us fucking terrified. <laughs> I've never been more scared in my life. Really? Like, I think this, I've been through some stuff in my life, but I don't think I've ever been as scared as realizing that now we were up against the big, the big indies. Mm. Like super great box was up against like, uh, QCF design with uh, desktop dungeons. Like the games that were in there were games that you read about on the internet. And we had like weird little shooty game <laughs> that looked like Mario Bros. 
and was coming out three days apart from Super Meat Boy, which is a game with nine letters in common. Like, everything about Super Crate Box was terrifying, and this was our shot. Like, we were originally, originally going to release it on Xbox Live Arcade, but we realized nobody cared about it. So we made this our business card. And we hoped that by making it freeware, enough people would play it that if we would make a next game, we would be able to make some money. Right. Uh, Super Crate Box was really clever. Uh, it's basically an anti-camping game. The idea is that you collect these little crates that you see on the screen, and every time you collect a crate, you get a random weapon. You don't know whether it's better, you don't know whether it's worse, but you get a random weapon, and you get a point. And then everything else is based on that. It's crates, crates are score, not kills are score, and it changed everything. You can't play this game like most games you play. Um, it was super clever, and it's the reason we decided to make that one. Um, but suddenly being at GDC for the IGF, like... Right out of the gate. First first game, right? Yeah. This, yeah. Like, imagine starting on your second game and being like, well, so are, what, are we going to do better than that now? Or is that going to be the best thing we made for the rest of our career? Right. Um, it might actually have been the best thing we made in our career. Like, it is, it has a level of elegance that is unparalleled in any other Flambeer work. It, it is clean uh it is beautiful design uh I, I just it's gorgeous it's a gorgeous game uh it's it's the one game that we made that i look at and go like i don't think we could have changed anything and made it better mm. uh that was purely us like ridiculous fishing is another game that i i gen just it's just beautiful right it's hard to believe that i was part of the creation of it because you look at it and you're just like this is it's so pure and so true. Does that sound bullshit? It's it's, it's your so game. True. You can say whatever you want about it. <laughs> that's, um, that's the great thing of making your own game. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Fishing is so true, but it, it wasn't just us. Mm. It was also Zach Gage and Greg Woolland, uh, two other people that I highly respect, and I had a on the music. Uh, Super Great Box, the design and like the the way it works is JW and me, and. It's extremely good, but it was scary. It was so scary because you make that first game and now there's expectations. Radical Fishing made $10,000, so now we have to make money. Mm. Super Great Box got nominated for an award and then didn't win it, which is exceptionally Dutch as well. <laughs> um, and we were okay with that. But the, you know the weird thing about Vlambeer, I think if, if you chart Vlambeer through the years, is that we were always at the right time, at the right place at the right time. Mm. And I don't know how much of it was intentional, but I think Vlambeer grew as indie grew. And at every time there was a, a, a branch in realities that could have occurred, Vlambeer was kind of a part of what branch we went down. Uh, Flash games, mobile games, uh, clones, um, a Devolver Digital. Like Devolver Digital is a, it's funny that you mention it. You know, we were the first indie game that Devolver Digital published. Mm -hmm. That was it was Serious Sound the Random that. Encounter. <laughs> that was the, and the wild thing about that is we genuinely thought we had never heard of these people. They reached out to us and they were like, Hey, you want to do a serious sound game? And we're like, You are suits. <laughs> like, you know, we thought I was a suit. I thought these guys were a suit because all they had was this IP called Serious Sam, which I love. I love Serious Sam. But they didn't make it. Crow Team makes that. What the fuck was Devolver Digital? Are they just a bunch of people with bags of money? Um, we started Googling them, and it turned out a lot of them were from these other publishers that were quite infamous that we didn't necessarily want to work with. Mm. But the guy that emailed us, uh, Nigel Lowry, uh, he, he sounded very nice. And I just couldn't email back and be like, no, we're not making a serious sound game. Like, I think 14-year-old me would have, like, reappeared and just punched me in the face and go, like, no, you're making this fucking game. Yeah. So um, so we came up with an idea to make the worst pitch possible. And then they would say no, and we could at least like Go soften our ways. conscience. Yeah. yeah. And then the Volver would... So we pitched them a turn-based RPG, which is the opposite of Serious Sam, like high-speed, frantic action. Uh, and they just went like, hey, if that's what you want to make, sure, here's the bag of money. And we were just like... I think that's the okay, Devolver way now. I think that's what they would call it as the Devolver way. 
Seems like that's what so, they do. <laughs> so that's the funny thing. When we worked with Devolver, it went super well. And we had a great time. A serious Sound of Random Encounter is absolutely not the best game we made. It's not the best game Devolver published, not even by a long shot. But it was one of, one of like, it was very early on. And um, we had this connection with so much of the indie scene. And they would talk to us because back in the days, and back in the days, money was a dirty word in indie in 2010. Oh. And I was the indie that went, no, 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 I want to earn money with this shit. And that meant that a lot of indies didn't like me, right? Like, this is, I know that sounds hard to believe for a lot of people nowadays, but I was like the anti-indie for a while. Um, but then we grew up. That's the thing that changed. All these school kids became university kids. All these university kids finished university, and now suddenly we needed money. And there was a period of time where indies wanted around me. They wanted somebody who could handle their business. Right? They wanted somebody who could negotiate and, and do that stuff. And when those indies would come to us, um, would come to me to talk, um, there were a few that were so good that I went, you should talk to Devolver. And we ended up introducing Devolver to Denaton, who ended up doing Hotline Miami. Gotcha. Um, and from there, Devolver's just momentum and like the the work that is just the exceptional uh trust that they have in their developers like propelled them mm. to like un unbelievable heights right like just in, they do an e3 just, conference now <laughs> like, and, and that's the thing i think that the thing i love about devolver is that they're very much an indie first publisher like they care about this stuff the the, the thing that i this and i don't want to say dislike but the thing that i always think about is how much did the rise of Devolver necessitate things like Devolver? Like, would indie look completely different if those boutique publishers had never taken off? Would it have been better? Would it have been worse? Um, but then at the same time, the folks at Devolver are so genuine and so kind and so nice that this is probably the better outcome of the two. You know, like, it's hard to imagine indie without, without them. Um, but every time there was a branch in reality, it feels like somehow Flamber was there and it was not like brilliant maneuvering. It was not like, uh, like us being geniuses. It was just, this is how it grew. Sure. And as it grew, people came to Flamber because it was one of the like defining indie studios. And in a way it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. People came to us to evolve the industry. We would help that, which would mean we were at the forefront of the evolution. And then we just kept doing that for 10 fucking years. <laughs> and, and then it ran, like, I don't know if you want to talk about how Flambeer shut down. We will. Uh, I, now. I, I want to just okay, jump we'll, in here. We'll, we'll get to that we'll for sure. Because um, okay. uh, you said you were scared shitless when Super Crate Box did well. Uh, and you guys were at IGF and, and you know, that that was intimidating. Uh, with... Ridiculous fishing, formerly radical fishing before that, uh, you know, and doing research for this, I feel like I was just going from like article to article to story to story and that there is so much that has been written about and, and so many things like you're saying with Flambeer kind of being on the, the different forks of reality, uh, so to speak. Uh, this one seems potentially one of the biggest uh, attached to Flambeer when it comes to just the story around it. Um, but before any of that, before we talk about, uh, the idea of iOS clones and, and how big it was for the company and all that simply starting, what, what is ridiculous fishing? How, how did that start? Where did the idea come from? And, and I'll show a little bit of it as well. Radical fishing was a flash game that we had to make because we were broke. Um, and the one way you would earn money as a game developer back in 2010 was you would make these flash games. And then these flash games would go onto these giant websites and these giant websites would then pay you a little bit of money and then earn money via ads, right? And you were either going to put it on new grounds and it, you would make basically no money or you were going to sell it to um, games.com or whatever it was, right? Mm. Um, and those school kids would play it uh, in, their, in their breaks or during their class, um, including us. Um, so we made that, we earned $10,000, and the idea came from um, 
a documentary about overfishing where there was this beautiful slow motion shot of a fish being flung into the air and a, a discussion about duck hunt uh, <laughs> where we're talking about shooting things on a screen and then there was this beautiful slow motion this beautiful slow motion fish and we're just like what if we shoot the fish and he's like uh, okay yeah we, i guess we can do that um and um that game, the, the, the heart of that game is that we wanted to make the best Flash game ever. So we started looking at what makes Flash games good and what makes Flash game goods is earning rewards. Okay. So uh, JW's sense of progression really quickly created this really tight loop of like play the game, earn a bit of money, buy a new thing, play the game, earn a bit of money, get a new thing. I ended up programming it in Flash and uh, I ended up like adjusting the progression and adjusting like the tutorialization, and then we sold it for ten thousand dollars. Now that game I went into the background. We made a few other games, and then in two thousand and twelve, there was a guy in the Netherlands. It was sort of a big deal in the indie scene back then, and um, we were trying to show him Super Crate Box. But before we showed him Super Crate Box, we had him play Radical Fishing, and he just wouldn't stop. It was the most annoying thing that ever happened to me in my life because we really wanted to show this guy the game. Oh, this was 2010 because it was before the IGF. Um, and he just kept playing this shitty thing we made for $10,000 like just to, to get some money. And then he went... I should introduce you to a guy I know in New York who makes iOS games. And this was like a big skill back in the days. Like Nobody made iOS games because iOS was hard, like, right. you know, Flash is easy, Windows executable is easy. How do you even make an iOS? Do you need a phone? Do you program them on computers or something? Like, we didn't know. <laughs> um, you needed a Mac. Who has a Mac? Like, let's be real. Like, who, who owns a Mac? Like, we didn't know Macs. We were making Windows games. Um, so uh, we went to Zach Gage, and um, Zach... Uh, just just went, Zach played it and just fell in love with Radical Fishing. And he said, yep, I'm in. And then we needed an artist because Zach was the programmer. Uh, and we loved Zach because the things he made were ridiculous. Zach is a conceptual artist, not a game developer. Mm. Um, the games he made were ridiculous. He made a game called Bitpilot, which is still one of the best shmups on uh, iOS, even to this day. More importantly, he made a game called Lose Lose, which is Space Invaders, but every time you shoot an enemy, it deletes a file off your computer. Um, and I'm not kidding. Like, it actually <laughs> just straight up deletes a game from your computer. Uh, the enemy will actually have the extension of the file. It will delete when you kill the file. Uh, and it's just, you can get a high score at the risk of your documents folder, I guess. Right. Um, and it's like for the people watching, like, please understand this game will straight up actually really not kidding delete games off of your computer. <laughs> it's not uh, a joke. This is real life. I am not exaggerating. <laughs> it is not a bluff. This is actually really truly what, what happens. Um, but uh, I love that. Like, that, I just immediately, I was like, I want to work with this guy. Um, and then the artist we got was Greg Woolwind, who was part of a collective called Mike and Greg back then. And they made a game called Solipskier, which was one of the best iOS games out there at the time. Like, it was a beautiful, weird skiing game. Um, it, was, it was kind of popular. All of us were uh, small time at the time. Like, we'd done, like, we'd gotten, like, an IGF award, like, nomination. Zach had gotten an IGF award nomination. Greg had gotten an I award, uh, iOS uh, IGF award nomination. I don't think any of us had ever won anything, and none of us had made a hit. Um, Ridiculous Fishing was, I think we made the Flash game, the best Flash game ever. Let's make the best iOS game ever. And um, that was it. That was the plan. That, that was the whole story. We were going to do that game again properly mm. with good art with good design, uh, with a good programmer, and we were going to do it on iOS, where the only games that we knew had ever had success on iOS were Catabolt and, um, and Solipskier. That was it. Hmm. Uh, I mentioned the idea of iOS clones, and, and I feel like this one, uh, with Ridiculous Fishing, it was one of the first involved 
uh, with now what is really the ever-present act of, of iOS clone games. Uh, it even prompted you guys to kind of put the browser game uh, Vlambeer Clone Tycoon out there, uh, a somewhat satirical comment on the whole situation. Looking back at it all now, are you happy with how you guys handle it? Uh, it would you do anything yeah. differently uh, with kind of the I'm idea so of iOS happy, clones? So happy you phrased that question that way. Um, because it, it sucked. The whole thing sucked. It was the... It was hard. Like, Flambeer for three years made games back to back. And every time we made a game, it was a success. It made money, uh, or it was like critically received well. The freeware things we did uh, went well. Uh, nobody cared about indie when we started. The press didn't write about indie. And by the time it was 2013, the press started caring about indie, right? Like, people started caring. Um, I think that was also the first time I ever heard about Twitch. Like or Justin TV, whatever, like whatever it was back then. Sounds about this right. was a different was a different era of. <laughs> that's the story. Um, <laughs> somebody, somebody from Justin or Twitch, whatever it was at the time, came to me at PAX and went like, "So here's the pitch. I work for this company called Justin TV or Twitch. I don't remember which one it was back in the days. And um, so it's live YouTube, and people can talk to the people that are." that are like making videos, but they play games live. Um, could you hand us a number of game codes of your game so we can give them to some of the people that are doing this? And we were just like, I ain't sure if this is ever gonna be a thing, but you know what? <laughs> Sounds cool, here's some keys. Um, and we stayed friends with those people ever since, but it was, it was do you, funny. Do you happen to know the creators that got those keys? Did you watch them back in the day? No, because I had no idea how to get to that. Oh, like, okay. They, they didn't no like idea. follow up. Gotcha. No, no. This like I don't know. Like this was this was carnage. Uh, yeah, yeah. I so, figured it was probably carnage. The the one that yeah. uh, that was. But he was, he was he was so happy. He was so incredibly happy that we gave him keys because apparently we were the only one that gave him keys that day. Everybody else thought he was nuts. Yeah. Um. Probably true. It's so, carnage. <laughs> I mean, also true. Um. But. Um, this was a different time. It's not this. It was not how things are now, and I think what what really hurt is that when when Ridiculous Fishing got cloned, JW and I hadn't realized how hard we'd been working for three years straight, and we were this close to like a burnout, and. It was the first bad news we ever had, right? And it just, it was a gut punch. We, we'd been working on Ridiculous Fishing for a few months and it was going super well. And then suddenly the San Francisco-based game studio um, had contracted an Indonesia-based game studio um, to basically just straight up clone Radical Fishing, right? And now suddenly here we were with a game we'd spent a lot of time and money on and it was not ours anymore. It just, it, we maybe naively believe that creativity gets rewarded um, and that cynicism does not. And here was the evidence that cynicism is the better choice, right? Like you just steal some stuff, market it harder or be done faster and uh, make some money. Um, so we, we tried everything. We talked to these developers. We asked them if they could delay their game. We asked them if we could collaborate. Uh, and they eventually, on one of our emails, they just sent back game just launched. And that was the last time we, we emailed with them. Um, made a million dollars in no time. It was received super well. Every review was hyper positive. Uh, such a unique game concept, like original. Um, Unlike anything ever played before, um, one of them was like a triumph of a triumph of creative and original design, and like every time it's like getting stabbed in the face, like it just. I, I've been wanting to be a game developer since I was six, right, and. You you sit there at your at your desk, 
and you open your laptop and you look at the the you look at the blinking cursor on your screen that you've used for 15 16 17 years now to to make to make things in the hope that one day it rewards you and you stare at the cursor and just your head explodes with just pain like just a migraine like the stress had gone to me the burnout had hit me the the disbelief that this was happening had hit me and i just couldn't i just couldn't write i just couldn't write a single line of of code i couldn't write a single letter of of email um i was scared man like i was so scared that in 3 years i finally got there right like i was i was there I, this was my dream I was programming video games. My name was on things. I, I was making cool stuff. And this was the end. Like I couldn't use the computer anymore. And then the next day I couldn't use the computer. And the next day I couldn't use the computer. And it, it didn't get better for weeks because I had burned out. Um, and after a few weeks, I got angry instead. I got so angry. I was so pissed off. And um, and JW was so pissed off, and we did the thing. We did our thing. JW started working on Lift Trousers, which was a very aggressive shooting game. Um, I ended up emailing everything. I was like, you know what? If these fuckers are gonna get rich off of our game, um, we're gonna take them down. So I emailed everything. I emailed the New York Times. I emailed the Washington Post. I like I didn't care that they were big newspapers. I didn't care that they were the CIA. I emailed the CNN. Like what the. What am I doing? I'm an Indian game developer, but I was angry and I was going to go. It, it's funny that you said you emailed CNN. That actually auto played after watching that is this interview of you on CNN. <laughs> so, it, I don't want everybody. to play too much of this, but yeah. <laughs> Just literally everybody, because it, this couldn't be real. It couldn't be that there are these, that there are creatives like us making games getting just destroyed by this. And we were close. We were so close to to being done. We discussed quitting. Um, we were running out of money. A studio in Canada saved us. A Canadian game studio emailed us and went like, hey, we saw the thing that happened. Same thing happened to us. If there's any iOS work that you need help with, I'll let us know. And Zach was burned out the same way we were. Greg was like, like we were all done. Uh, and this Canadian studio ported Super Crate Box to iOS, and that made us a few thousand dollars, which was just enough to keep us afloat. Mm. Um, but it worked. People started paying attention. People started talking about this. And it, and once again, on the branch of reality, the Flambeer was in the crosshairs. Like, it was not, we didn't, it just happened. And um, when we spoke at GDC, um, it was a statement like that was a statement that the industry talked about that year that was the conversation all of a sudden yep. and um i don't know if it's true or not but the studio that made that clone has never been featured by apple again um which um and um ridiculous fishing launched unlike any game like there was no game. I don't think there's ever been a game before or a game since that launched with the goodwill of the entire games industry behind it. Um, everybody wanted this game to win because everybody knew what was at stake. Like this, this game had to prove that creative work, like the original creators of a game, will make a better game than the people who steal it. Mm. Um, that was the statement. And I was so tired when that game, I was so tired when that game launched. It was so hard. Um, after a year of treading water, um, we, me and Zach and Greg and Greg's friend Mike got in a car uh, after PAX and we did a road trip from Seattle to New York and we called it the week of hatred. And the whole, the, whole, the whole point was simple. Either by the end of the trip, we were going to hate each other or we were going to work on ridiculous fishing again. It was one or the other. Um, it ended up being the second. 
and we got that momentum. We started working on that again. JW like jumped back in. It started rolling. The game was done. And then came the scariest part because I had to market this game in a way that made people realize that we were not cloning them. We were not the clone. We were the original. How how do you communicate that, right? Um, so I tried everything, every single thing I could. I destroyed myself those weeks trying just I, – I was not going to lose. We were not going to lose. There was no way we were going to lose this. We were going to show that this was, this was it. This was video games. Um, and it, it just – it worked. I don't know why it worked. It just worked. And it was, it was, it was something. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll pry on that a little bit. And I guess by whatever metric you think fits, how successful was that game for you, for Lambeer? I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was an incredible success by every metric you could have think of, right? Like it proved what we wanted to prove. And honestly, if that was all it did, I would have been happy because that was all I wanted. Like I was ready to leave games forever because we were going out of business, right? Like that, that was it. Like if this was the last statement, sure. Like if this was the last thing Flambery would ever do, let's go. Um, we were going to take them down and we took them down, but it was also, uh, commercially a massive success like it changed Flambeer from scrappy indies into a studio with capital a capital s we suddenly had funds to make whatever idea we could come up with um we could pay the people we work with like real amounts of money um and critically um i think it was a top three game of the year on metacritic like this was not an easy year either. I don't remember what happened in like 2013, but I, like it, it was up there for, I think for most of the year. I don't know if it ended in the top three or top 10 or whatever it was, but um, we won the Apple Design Award. We won the Apple Game of the Year. And we were nominated for a GDC Award, which was like the IGF's big brother. Uh, Elijah Wood like, liked the game. Like this was... It, well, is, was, hold on, hold on. I, is this now? Is this Elijah Wood post or pre Frodo? This is post Frodo. Post no, Frodo, no. Elijah Wood. Holy shit, the, Rami! I met Elijah <laughs> Wood by punching him on the shoulder because he walked by me. He was. We were at a movie festival, and he walked by me, and I went like, "He likes my game." I should say I made it. So I just I tried to tap him on the shoulder, but he was further away than I thought. So it just kind of ended up being like a. <laughs> And, uh, well, how very, do you respond? <laughs> Who the fuck? What the fuck? Just very confused. <laughs> He's also shorter than you think, so I, I kind of hit him a little high. Hold like, I was very happy I didn't hit him. Rami, he was a hobbit. <laughs> well, from the Dutch perspective, yes. Okay. Uh, but okay. you, he didn't need any movie magic to be small compared to me. Correct. Uh, I also, most ridiculous story, I got a back rub from James Bond. Now, this is very important. Rami, which James Bond? I knew you were going to ask that. The only one that only played it once. It was George Lazenby. <sighs> and I love it. I love that that's the one. Because here's the thing. You know what the thing is about George Lazenby? That man is James Bond. And you know why he is James Bond? Because that's, <laughs> that's just him. He's an incredibly charming kind of strange man <laughs> the conversation that we had was about his game his his like kids or like i don't know if he has kids whatever it is like young kids in his life like emptying his his bank account by playing ios games mm. and then eventually he never introduced himself he never said what he was we were at this hollywood fancy thing i was way out of my place there that this wasn't my people um he never introduced himself. Eventually, uh, we talked about me the entire time. He didn't, he didn't want to talk about him. He, he kept switching it back to me. And then eventually, the lady up front goes, okay, the, the next award is being handed out by nobody else than James Bond. Guy gets up, walks to the stage, hands out an award, 
comes back, sits down, looks at me and goes, you still going to eat that dessert? I'm like, no, he's, he's, can I have it? I'm like, yeah, yeah sure, mate. <laughs> uh, so I gave him my dessert. He eats my dessert. And then he looks at me after he finishes it. And he's like, that was the only reason I was here. Like, I had to hand out the award. Dessert was good. I'm going to sneak off good. And I was like, okay. Guy gets up, gets behind me, gives me like a back rub, right? It's just like, good luck with whatever you do, kid. He walks to the door, and you know the door, the, the kind of like uh, conference hall doors that have like you one of push. those push buttons? Yeah. You gotta push the, the like metal bar thing. Oh, yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't go out that way. No, he puts his back to the door. He looks around, sees if nobody's noticing, and he just rotates out. It was one smooth move. <laughs> This he guy watched is James, James Bond. Bond. He was. This guy didn't play James Bond. This guy just watched James Bond. Uh, oh, and that's, man. I guess that's why he only did one, because I don't now, think you can make movies with a James Bond. Like That's not how it works. You need an actor. Were there any uh, consulates that were murdered or uh, you know taken out at the, <laughs> I, the event I, that, you, that you heard of? I would not be surprised. Okay. All know. right. You never know. You never know. I mean, he's James Bond. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, it was like, I... Guy just, he never needed to act, I think. He, just, <laughs> if he had played it for the rest of his life, it would have been James Bond every time. <laughs> uh, moving forward with with uh, the Vlam beer story, uh, you guys would go on to release a bunch of different games after Radical Fishing. You, you mentioned uh, one of them already. I apologize for the pronunciation of it. Uh, Luft, Luft trousers, something like that. Yeah. Close enough Luftrausers. with my butchered yeah. uh, American accent. Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, um, and then, of course, uh, Nuclear Throne uh, as well. Um, out of all the, the different games you guys created, um, and I guess now kind of hearing the story around ridiculous fishing, uh, out of your mouth, what, uh, what was like your, your favorite game and the hardest game? Is that both too ridiculous fishing or, or does it go elsewhere? So what was the hardest game? The hardest game was ridiculous fishing. I think sure. the second hardest game was, was nuclear throne. Mm -hmm. Um, what was the other one? The hardest and the? Uh, just the one that you enjoyed the most that you look back and you think like, yeah, that, that, that was a good one. That's one that I had fun developing, had fun playing. I think you know about what? It. the the one I liked making most was Yeti Hunter, which nobody ever heard about. Um, <laughs> okay. but, uh, Yeti Hunter. So back in 2009, uh, Mr. Badunkian, back then all Indies went by nicknames. I was, I, I was Rami. I was the only one who was just his name, right? Like Indies didn't like me. Uh, I broke all their rules. Um, Mr. Pedunkian and I forgot who the other was made a game called Dungeon. Okay. And Dungeon was high level shit. Like, so it was a side scroller, um, and it was basically Mario. It was you just got, went left to right. You had to save the princess, um, and there was like a bunch of screens that kind of went like in, in a U shape, I guess, more Metroid, I guess. Mm. Um, it had like eight screens. And it came out before YouTube, like, was a big deal, right? Like, the, it, it was there, but nobody was recording gameplay video. And, um, and the thing is, there were, there were eight or nine screens, uh, similar to V, if you played it, V, 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 V. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Um, um, every screen had a name, and every screen had obstacles. And the first obstacle was a jump. It was just a, there was a bridge, you had to jump over it. And... Um, when they released this game, the forum exploded because people were just fighting with each other. And the reason they were fighting was that um, people would post, like, I can't make the first jump. There's no way to make the first jump. They're just, I've tried for like an hour. You cannot do the first jump. And then other people would respond with, like, what are you talking about? Like, I, I beat the game. Like, give me 10 minutes. Like, it's, it's easy. Uh, and then other people would be like, no, the bats move too fast. You cannot beat the bats on the third. So, like, they move too fast. Like, how is that possible? You cannot do it. Um, after three or four days of this forum of gamers devolving into complete and utter chaos, it turned out that what the game did is at the start, it made a hardware profile of your computer. And based on your hardware, it would make one or none of the screens impossible. So on... 8% of computers, that first jump, it was impossible. The huh. gravity was just tweaked slightly higher. Um, 
and you couldn't beat it. And this, or the spikes were slightly wider, or the hitbox on the spikes was slightly wider. Sure. And you would never see it on a screenshot. You would never see it in a GIF, right? Like it would never, like the hitbox were just like slightly tweaked. Uh, <laughs> so JW and I, at one point, we watched this documentary about, um, we watched a lot of documentaries about um, this guy, discovery documentary about Yetis. And there was this guy and he was getting interviewed about how he had seen the Yeti. And the thing is, I believe that if you're going to give somebody a platform, you can't make fun of them, right? Not, not for this kind of person. Like there's enough people that deserve to be made fun of. This was just a guy that believed there's a Yeti, that he saw a Yeti. Like he's harming nobody. Mm. Um, they made fun of him. So Jerobi and I went, I want, we want the world, we want people to feel like this man did, where you are so sure you've seen the Yeti and then people make fun of you. So we used that same trick. We made a game in which you hunt the Yeti, and there is no Yeti. It's a giant snow mountain uh, with trees and like blood and trails, and there just literally is no Yeti. Uh, you, had a, you had a sniper gun that you could scope, right? And, um, and that you could climb trees, and like there was a snowstorm, and like it was hard, like there was fog, but then like 1% of players had a very small chance of spawning a Yeti. And uh, it would look like some of the snow clumps. And as soon as you scoped your gun, there was one frame where the entire screen was black. We would just delete the Eddie. Um, <laughs> then on top of that, we also drew the Yeti off resolution. So, you know, pixel games have a certain resolution. Sure. This Yeti was drawn at a slightly different resolution. So somebody actually found it, screenshotted it, posted it to Twitter, and then got like destroyed for having photoshopped it because the <laughs> resolution went off. Um, That's evil. It was incredibly evil, and uh, we we did not reveal that that is how Yeti Hunter works for a very long time. Nice. Um, and I, I I apologize to I apologize to that person. To that in person. The end. Yeah. What what um, uh, what what year did that come out? Do you remember? Twitter was a thing, so it could really... 14. Okay. 2014, 20, somewhere 2014 or something. Yeah. Uh, it's still it's still out there, but like now everybody knows how it works. We just put a version out there that, you know, has a slightly higher chance of spawning the Yeti, but the, the yeah. fun was that one moment. Sure. Sure. Uh, um, yeah. Huh. Yeah, I, I had not heard of that one. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, it's because there, there's no point in playing it anymore. Like the, sure yeah the gone. secret's out it's over. Yeah, yeah yeah that makes sense uh so you guys announced uh together uh september 1st earlier this month that that Vlambeer would be shutting down um citing different paths for you and uh jw uh over the past couple of years we're also calling the whole announcement in your own words over dramatic uh can you explain that statement a little bit but what what was <laughs> Is it because of a 10 year old company making a big deal out of closing up or, or what, what about that was over dramatic? It's a thing where you go, folks, come here, there's a party. We're 10 years old. Also we quit. Like that's it. It's very flamber. It's like, we're not, we're like, we don't say things quietly. We didn't want to have a celebration of 10 years. And then six months later go like we done. It was like, <laughs> no, okay. The, the make it a big statement. Yeah, the anniversary was that we're closing. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 like our ten year anniversary surprise is we quit. We're done. We don't we don't want to do this anymore. Mm. You know, it's not that Vlambeer was um it wasn't bad. It was just done. Like the thing people the thing people don't recognize about Vlambeer, I think, is that it was in a way, it was always a statement studio. It was a studio that existed to make the statement that you could do this. Like we were the two guys that dropped out of school and were using Game Maker. Like we weren't using Unity or Unreal or any of the, like we were using Game Maker, which was developed for like fourteen-year-old kids to like make games about cars. Um, we everything we did was always a statement. Um, uh, Nuclear Throne was the first game that got sold on Twitch, right? Like we sold games on Twitch before Twitch tried being a store, uh, just by attaching the subscribe button to uh, Steam keys. Uh, so you could buy our game on Twitch. We were the first one to ever do that. 
that is the kind of statement we always wanted to make. And we're out of we're out of statements. Like Flamber was out of statements. The type of games Flamber made, you don't need to prove you can make those. Like you don't need to prove you can be a two person studio. You don't need to prove you don't we don't have anything left to prove like we don't have anything left to say there's so much that needs to happen in the games industry um there's so much that needs to happen um and none of it is something flambeer can do um for jw i think the the speed at which flambeer grew was always Flamber was always ahead of us. Like we were always catching up with Flamber. And I think JW is just kind of done catching up with things. Like you just want to make things chill. Um I think the way he sort of he sort of told me is like if he can create a way in which he can lazily create games for the rest of his life with a bunch of friends every time, that he would do that. Um that's not what I want to do. Like I want to build I want to build stuff. I want to build big things. I want to change this industry for the better. Um, maybe make some bigger games. Um, maybe build something that can grow. Like I don't know what I'm like. I don't know exactly what I'm doing yet. But I've got, you know, like I I have the need to create, so I will create. Uh, I just the context of Lambert didn't work for either of us anymore, and the necessity of Lambert had disappeared. Like we don't. We don't need to be Flamber anymore to live. Like we, we're good. Right. Um, Story was told. So then, <laughs> In yeah, some so, sense, yeah. Yeah. So why let it bleed out? Like Flamber doesn't bleed out. Have you seen that studio? Like we're a bear on fire. Like you don't let a bear <laughs> on fire bleed out. Like it goes to bed. Like it goes to bed and the flames go out and it sleeps happily ever after. And the fact that nobody ever asked if the bear was okay, like that's upsetting, man. Like, that bear was on fire. People need to ask that kind of stuff. Um, but it was good. It was good times. It was just, it was very pleasant. Uh, we had a great time. We did incredible stuff. What a legacy. Like, what, and, and how cool to end that legacy. Like, how cool to be a game studio that just says, like, we're done. When we reached out to the press, they were like, so what's the scandal? Like, out of money? Like, fight? They're like, no, we just we quit. They're like, no, game studios don't quit. They're like, no, we we quit. We're done. Like I I told them what I just told you. Um like we're just out. We're out of things. Um we're out of statements. Like there's stuff we need to do, but it's not it's not Flamber. Right. And we got to end the studio on a statement. Like on a loud, obnoxious statement. Like, how good is that? Like, Vlambeer, Vlambeer ended the way Vlambeer started. Uh, just loud, big, over the top, way ahead of what we are. Um, but we come out better. Mm. Like, couldn't have dreamed that 10 years. Like, come on, I couldn't have dreamed any of this 10 years ago. Yeah, that's true. What a... <laughs> JW would always make fun uh, of me and say, like, what a life. You know what? He's right. Like, what a life. <laughs> Incredible. Um, alongside releasing games with Flambeer over the past 10 years, uh, you personally released uh, some of your own initiatives, uh, Press Kit and Distribute, uh, which you describe as, uh, in your own words, free online tools for indies to prep and distribute press kits and marketing materials, demi-ready copies of games and other materials to press members. Where'd the idea... Uh, come from to kind of start that and what's the biggest success story that you've heard uh from users of those two um oh things that you've created I mean, um so distribute is a little harder because it is it is a tool that uh, had a very specific sort of lifespan and hmm. press kit is strange strange so in 2011 uh Game developers make these things called press kits, right? And they're basically a kit that the press can use with screenshots and videos and short descriptions and like team uh, descriptions. And every time you make a new one, and everybody had their own style of doing it, and a lot of them were really bad because people got this like, okay, I have to explain the life story of everybody. It's like reading recipes on a website, you know? Like first you read the life story of the person, and then you read like the trip where they met the person that taught them the recipe, and then you learn the life of the person that taught them. And then the recipe happens. It's like, 
take an egg, break it, and, and add salt. And you're like, why did I scroll for seven minutes? <laughs> um, a lot of press kits were that way. Like, it was hard to get access. People do, like, if you want screenshots, email us. Like, press don't have time for that. Like, they just need the screenshot. Send us the screenshot. So I said, I said I'm going to make the best press kit, but also I'm a programmer. And Vlamir was releasing a lot of games, so I'm like, I'm going to automate it. I'm going to make a thing, and I'm just going to drop in some screenshots, I'm going to write two lines of text, and it's going to turn into this beautiful press kit that just connects your games together. So I went to some friends in the press, and I went to a bunch of developers, and I just said, like, what do you need to make it easy? And I told the press, what do you make to me make, make your life easy? And between all that fe feedback, I created the press kit. And um, it was an instant hit. And of everything I've done in my career, like Prescott is probably the biggest thing. It is used by mostly all indies. And those that don't use it have copied the, the structure of it. Um, like the, the biggest, like No Man's Sky used it. Uh, no Man's Sky was on Prescott. Um, <laughs> And then, like a lot of big games uh, were on press kit. Like the, even AAA games used press kit like occasionally, which blew my mind. But there were a number of like larger games that ended up using press kit. Not my version of it, but they just copied how it looked. Um, it's everywhere. Like it's everywhere. Like everybody uses it. Uh, it's way beyond me. Um, but it's it. I get thank yous every day from people that are using it and they're just like i have no idea how to do this i just copied your thing seems good people like it <laughs> i get thank yous from press that are like i just talked to these kids they have no idea what they're doing and the only reason they had a press kit is because everybody said they had to use yours and if you didn't have that i wouldn't be able to write this story um yeah it was an accident i i was lazy and i didn't want to make more press kits and then <laughs> why i was testing it the Autodad guys, uh, Phil Tobotowski, are now working on Bug Snacks, which is probably the game of the decade, um, <laughs> based on the amount of hype it has. Sure. Um, they, uh, Phil Tobotowski, um, was the man. Uh, was the guy that came to me and said, "Like, hey, can we can we use this? It, like, I don't want to do this either. Can you just?" Can you just send this to me? And I'm like, I mean, it's not really, I'm not going to make this public, but I'll send you a copy. And then a day later, I was like, why am I not making this public? I'm going to make this public. It was the same time the Devolver was getting a big deal. And it, like, it was starting to be really important for indies to get their marketing right, because now we were competing with Devolver Digital. Um, so... For me, I think the challenge has always been how do you level the playing field in such a way that people that do good creative work have a chance, right? And press kit was a way to go. Like, it doesn't matter whether you're good at marketing or not. Press kits will never be an issue for anybody again. Um, Distribute was born from the same thing. It just had a very specific lifespan. Because um, a lot of large companies started selling those services and like just making them better. And the difference between press kit and Distribute is that press kit you self-host. I give you the files, you put it on your website, that's it. Well, distribute is hosted by me and it needs updates and it needs maintenance. And I just, I can't keep up with how many people ended up using distribute. Yeah. And then larger companies, uh, I, I know Evolve PR, like basically copied it and did their own version of it. You know what, that's fine. Like I don't need, I don't need a monopoly on like ways to reach out to press. <laughs> like I did, please no, let sure. somebody else do that. Sure. Um, we can all email Jeff Keeley, and he's like, "Oh, he did great yesterday for Sony. Keighley. Yeah, he was fantastic uh, announcing their." You have know. you ever? Okay, speaking of like moonshots, have you ever met somebody that just went like, "I'm gonna privatize," <laughs> just like game announcement? I like, don't. This is my I job. Don't I am the game announcer. I don't understand it. <laughs> I mean, he, I mean, he, he did it. Though. He, he did it. Like, I don't understand it. He, you're yeah. right. He said, "I'm gonna do this," and then he did it. Like. <laughs> more shout out to him it, it's fucking crazy but yeah remarkable yeah we'll uh we'll get to some of that in uh in the the next <laughs> section um as a result of of creating all those different tools you've you've earned accolades and garnered attention from a myriad of different organizations over the years uh what was the bigger honor for you 
being given the ambassador award from the 2018 game developers choice awards which you referenced earlier about the story with your father in the the first section of the uh the interview or uh incorporating bungie into your proposal plans within destiny all right so that's that's an interesting one um so the first one is i i didn't propose i was proposed to you were proposed to uh, well uh, then maybe maybe to. the the uh i mean you're still a part of it question still stands yeah, <laughs> yeah. i so here's the thing the award sitting right there um it doesn't the thing you learn about awards is the they're scary like having an award is it sets a it sets an expectation right like this thing taunts me more than it reminds me of my achievements because it's like this is the level that you strive for and have to strive for um i'm incredibly grateful for the trust of my peers right for the trust of of the community of the developer community um of my colleagues and my friends and all those people around the world that came together and voted for me to be the ambassador of the games industry, like the person they felt represents the hopes and aspirations of our, of our medium. Um, but here's the, the thing you learn about work, even if you love work, is that it's work. Like I am not Rami from Vlambeer, right? Like I'm, I'm Rami. I'm, I'm a human being that loves making video games and I literally cannot imagine what my life would be like without it. But, you know, the, the, the marriage um, with Adriel Wallach um, uh, didn't work out. Uh, in the end, we ended up divorcing, but um, on a friendly basis. Uh, but it's so much more meaningful to have somebody you love decide to like want to spend their life with you um there's nothing you could make i think that would feel more important than that um and i think even like even way smaller friendly or romantic gestures from um from friends or you know uh, partners or whatever in your life uh, the the um, the pride that my father had at that award, like it means more than that award, right? The award is a piece of plastic. What it rep what it represents is more important. Um, that proposal was incredibly over the top, right? Like she worked with Bungie to to put it in the game. Um, the guy that announced my GDC award actually was. The producer at Bungie that worked that in. Um, both of those represent the same things that we managed, like I managed, she managed, um, to collect such a beautiful network of amazing people around us, right? Um, that is more valuable than any of that. And yeah, no, between the two, the proposal will always be have a bigger place in my heart. Uh, because it that's it's life. That is life. The award is work. Uh, I love my work, but I there was a time in my life where I would choose that. I would have chosen the award. I would have said, like, no, this is this is who I am. Mm. I I don't want to be Rami from Flambeer. I want to be Rami. I want to be I want to be Rami Ismail. I'm a guy. I have I have a life. I enjoy my life. I'm very grateful for my life, but I also have my hard times. I also have my issues. I have the people that I love. I have the people I fall in love with. I have my friends. I have my family. Um, being in the public eye is uh, makes all of those things a little confusing sometimes. But um, you just if I want to be remembered for something, I just want to be remembered for being a nice human, I think. Like, I want to leave the world a better place. Like, I want to build these things that outlast me. I want to make the industry, um, I want to make the industry better structurally so that if I, 
if and when I die, uh, people can look at it and go like, wow, like I did good work. Like he made the industry a better place. But like, if they think that and go like, I don't I didn't really care as him as a, as a human though, like I think that wouldn't feel nice. Mm. I mean, Try to be reminded, it's just like, who's a, a good dude? Like, good human. Um, I think I figured that out over the past few years. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I guess you grow. Right? Yeah, it's very true. Uh, with all the struggles you faced or know about with Arabic and video games, what's the most ridiculous one? Wait, one more time? It was a very quick question, uh, but I, I guess the setup for the question is, I love following you on Twitter <clears throat> because you're very quick to point out the issues uh, that are out there with uh, Arabic and just media. With Arabic and video right. games, what's the most ridiculous uh, like struggle that you've seen? I mean, the, the thing I never get is, so Arabic is a complicated language, right? Um, because it is a cursive script, which means our letters are connected, but it's also written right to left. And the worst thing about it is computers were not built for Arabic. They were built for Latin letters. So they were built for A, B, C, as we know it, right. not Alif, B, T, C, as we know it in Arabic. Um, so um, the thing that gets me, so the worst ones are the ones that, just get it completely wrong, right? And they will print their letters backwards. So they'll, sp they'll spell the word backwards and disconnect it, which in English, you have to imagine writing a word backwards or writing a sentence backwards, but also adding and removing random spaces every three characters. Uh, like, because the spacing actually tells us where the words are because our letters are connected to each other. Right. Um, so as soon as you disconnect them, we don't know where a word starts or ends anymore. It gets a lot harder. Um, now the, um, there's one thing that's worse though, um, uh, because there is the people who just, they get it wrong, right? And when they get it wrong, it's embarrassing. Battlefield three is a game that had a hundred million dollars of budget and somehow they spelled a four letter word hotel fundo. They spelled it backwards and disconnected on like the largest set piece. Wait, was that on the Kirkland? Like a giant hotel. Was that on the map? Uh, it, it was the. No, it was in the campaign. Oh, Giant okay, hotel okay. building. You you blow it up that with a rock, with Never an RPG. Mind. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah no, Battlefield it was two was Carlin. Yeah. yeah, you said three. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, that was that was awful. But the thing that I find more fascinating is the ones who clearly had a clue that something was wrong, but somehow made it worse. <laughs> and I think my favorite example is I think it was a Viennese embassy. They took the Arabic, disconnected and backwards, and then just flipped it. But not like they inverted the letters. It's like they grabbed it in Photoshop. And just flipped the image. And just mirrored it. Yeah. So now it was Arabic letters written in the wrong direction. Every letter was in the wrong direction. <laughs> and they were still disconnected. <laughs> and I was just looking at it like, somebody told you, hey, this is wrong. It needs to be the other way around. And somehow your brain went didn't go to we should get an Arab to look at this. No, it went to it's the wrong way around. I'll flip it in Photoshop. <laughs> Don't worry, I got this. I got this. I understand. Like how yeah. How what, like there has to be a special level of arrogant you have to be to to go to this and go like I don't understand this language, but hey, I'll fix it. Um I think I I think I laughed for like five minutes and then I just I had like a silent angry cry for like two minutes. You sure. Know? Yeah. Um, it's a fight, uh, but it's it's shifting. Like I get, I actually just get uh, I get messages from like movie companies and like game studios and like all sorts to just be like, hey, is this Arabic? And at some point, I need to charge start charging money for that because it's getting a little out of hand now, but. For now, I just send back like, no, I made this website called isthisarabic.com that I can just refer to 90% of the cases. <laughs> um, Brilliant. But yeah, it's just, it's wild to me. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I love whenever you do, uh, I think maybe a Fast and Furious movie you pointed out once 
which might have been one of my favorites, or it was some action movie uh, that that yeah. just got it wrong completely, and you were you were calling out. Oh, it, it was the Netflix movie uh, Extraction, I think. Oh, uh, yep. well, that was that was something else, I think, as well. The but, yellow filter. Yeah, it was the yellow filter. Yeah, yeah. it's it's very uh, yep. just things that you don't think about until someone else points them out. And yeah. then it's just like, oh god. Did you know? Yeah. That the Arab world sky is not yellow. Yeah. Like, we have blue skies. It's wild. Who would have thought? They're, they're amazing. Would have thought. Um, uh, maybe cu- coupled with that, uh, game dev dot world. Um, right. I would assume this might start taking up more of your time uh, in a post Vlambeer world. Um, not necessarily really a question about it. I just think it's important to promote it. So, tell us about uh, game dev world. So Game of World is uh, a live conference that I started organizing. So as I traveled around the world and became a a public speaker, I realized that there was something strangely asymmetrical about it because I could speak to these people in English and they could understand in English, but they can't necessarily all speak English well enough to speak. Hmm. Um, I have the privilege of being able to fly all around the world because ridiculous fishing happened. Right. Um, But... I don't necessarily have the, um, I can't give that ability to other people, right? And at GDC for years, I ran a panel called One Reason to Be, where I invited six speakers from around the world to the US to speak at GDC at the largest game conference in the world so they could promote their work, to promote their perspective, and people could get a feeling for what beautiful things I see on all my travel. Um, but it's a thing. It, it was my grandma, actually, I think, that told me that, like, if you want to build something, you have to build it so it can outlast you, right? You have to be able to just die, like, and it still has to be there. And the thing I've done for the past 10 years, I can't, I can't die. Like, if if I were to pass away right now, the network I've built, the connections I've built, the the opportunities that I can open for people go away because I never built a structure out of it. So Game Dev World is my attempt to build a structure. And it's an online games conference, uh, just like GDC, uh, just like the developer talks at PAX. Mm. Uh, But we allow people to speak in their own language. We translate their talks. And we translate it to all the other languages that are represented at the event. And we we currently support eight languages, uh, English, uh, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Russian, Spanish, um, Brazilian, Portuguese, and French. Um, people can speak in whatever, whichever language of those they know, and people can listen to whatever language they they can. We subtitle all of it. Um, it only exists because me and Miriam Lachapelle and Sarah Almale, who organize it, had no idea what we were getting into. Every event organizer we talked to was like, this is absurd and obscene and you will never pull it off and you should not even start at, like trying it. And they were right. It is a terrible idea, but also, and now that I've done it, I can't not do it. Like, I, I can't not do it. Like the, the, the value, that, I had a Portuguese developer email us in Portuguese. We translated it to Arabic and then forwarded it to the Arabic speaker that they were talking to. That's what I do. Normally, I talk to these developers in in the Arab world, and I'll learn something, like Egypt is dealing with this problem this way, and then I end up in Uruguay, and somebody goes, like, oh, we have this problem. I'm like, the studio in Egypt told me that if you do this, this, and this, like, that's what I do. That's my that's my life. I connect people. I, I share knowledge that I gain around the world. This was doing it in a way that if I was gone, it could still do it. You just need somebody to route that email, but it doesn't have to be me. It can be anybody. Right. Um, so yeah, this is, this is my, this is my next like major focus is game Dev world. I want to build this into, I want to get this so far along the road that, you know, I don't want to die, but like, if I did, I wouldn't like, you know, I wouldn't go to like whatever version of heaven might or might not exist and go like, ah, wish I had done that. Right. Uh, like I, that, that has to be done. So this is my goal now. And um, for people wanting to maybe get involved or, or 
hashtag join the conversation in a shitty way of saying it. How do they do that? Uh, I think we might have crashed your website as well. Uh, <laughs> if, it, <laughs> if it was up and running. Uh, it was up and running. Okay, I think we crashed it then, uh, potentially. Oh, yeah. Yep, no, it looks like it. <laughs> yeah, uh, apologies for that. Um, That's okay. But is it is it just to um, visit the site, join the... the I, I know you have a Twitter account yeah. as well, but yeah, just... Promote yeah, that, please. The Game Dev World Twitter is probably the best the best place to follow. We're working on uh, we're working on some very exciting things actually. As Lambert uh, spun down, we uh, we started some initiatives, and we might have some really cool news uh, in the next few months. Uh, if you awesome. want to follow that, at Game Dev World is um, is the place on Twitter that you want to be, and uh, we will one hundred percent announce if more stuff happens. If you want to learn. A whole bunch of stuff about game development in places that you normally would never think about. Like, go check it out. Um, we will also be posting some of the old talks over the next few months, and a lot of them were really interesting as well. Awesome. Um, so, you know, um, it also just genuinely helps. Like, you know, we a lot of this kind of work is very expensive. The higher the number is that we can point at the more effective we can be in negotiations. So if you if you feel like supporting the thing I just described, a little literally your follow can be the difference between us getting like hundreds of thousands of dollars in sponsorships and and not getting it. Uh like please please do follow it. It, it will make a difference. Awesome. Yeah we'll get it we'll get the uh the Twitter link spammed up in the chat here. Uh thank you. I think we're gonna take a, our final break. Uh, we still have one more section to go running a little bit long, but, uh, I do want to get one more section in there. Uh, it'll be a little bit more focused on just kind of the general business. Uh, we've got some quick Q and a, maybe take some questions from the chat as well. And then, uh, we'll wrap up here on, uh, the first episode of friend DA. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with more right after this. We'll see you guys in about five minutes. 